welcome to the Valley of the Kings. Now, it's a very confusing place to visit if you want to um, enjoy it properly. So I'm going to try and give you some little secrets. Now, the Valley of the Kings is split up. Um, we've got some quiet places. We have the Tomb of Ai, and there is down some uh, wadis, which is the dry riverbeds, some other places where people generally don't tend to go. I'm going to give you some advice about selecting your three tombs. Currently, the ticket entitles you to three tombs. Uh, you can also pay for extra tickets to go in Ramsey 6 and Tutankhamun. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Carter House. Now, the Valley of the Kings is divided into two bits. We have the Western Valley, which is on the left-hand side. And then we have the main valley, and you can see all those little white lines and uh, blocks. Now those are the layouts of the tombs, and this map is taken from the Theban Mapping Project. And I really recommend that website as something to go to, to have a look beforehand, and get an idea of what you'd like to see, which tombs you'd like to go into, so that you can get a plan going. Now we're going into the Western Valley. Now the Western Valley is not made up with a tarmac road. It's a very quiet place to go to and it's sometimes called the Valley of the Monkeys as well. It's about two kilometres from the main ticket office and it's like it used to be um, when Howard Carter was excavating. Um, very, very quiet. Hardly anybody goes there. There's actually only one tomb open at the moment, which is the Tomb of I. Uh, there is another tomb in that valley, which is Amenhotep III, and the Japanese are currently excavating. And if you look at their website, you can see some really nice pictures of what the, the restoration and conservation that they're doing. Um, in Sharla, that may be open in the future. But let's have a look at the Tomb of I. Now, who was I? Now, um, I is from a family that was very powerful. Uh, Amon Hotep III, which I think most people have heard of, uh, the son of Tutmosis IV, married a lady of common descent. He proudly boasts on some scarabs that she is the daughter of these nobles, UA and PUA, and they have no titles, nothing, they're not um, uh, viziers or anything like that. Um, they are just common people. And he's very proud of this. Now, she had a brother who was called I, and he was married to a lady called Tay. So we have this uh, family relationship, um, brother-in-law of the king, but he never mentions that. So it's obviously not a big deal to be brother-in-law of the king. Um, it, the uh, extended family of the royal family is not um, uh, important enough. Not You have to be there of your own merit. Nobody ever says that they're the king's brother. They'll say that they're the king's son, or the king's wife, but not the king's brother. So it seems that once you, your brother becomes pharaoh, your royal status disappears. So brother-in-law is even less important. Now the next generation of this family, um, we start getting a little complicated. Uh, Amon Hotep III, his son was Amon Hotep IV. Um, and he changed his name to Arknarton and started what is commonly referred to as the Amarna Revolution, where he tried to replace the gods of Armen, Mut, and Khonsu, and um, Patar, and so forth, with just one god, the Arten. Um, and he moved his capital down to Amarna, he changed the art. Lots of things happened during this time. And he was married to Nefertiti. And we've all heard of Nefertiti, the iconic bust in the Berlin Museum. 
Now, Nefertiti had a sister, Mujmet, um, and we, there may be two ladies by this name, but that seems unlikely, but it seems that she um, was also married to Horemheb, who comes into the story later on. Um, uh, she's uh, n not significant of herself, but the fact that Horemheb is related into this family is significant. Um, on the other side, Kaya is a secondary wife of Artnaten. So Artnaten is married to Nefertiti, who we believe is from this UA and CUA family, um, and to Kaya. This UA and CUA family also have another daughter, Mutnojmet, who is married to Horemheb. So this is a, a very significant and powerful family. Further generations going down, Arknaten has two sons, Smenkare and Tutank Arten. Um, these are by his wife Kaya. Um, they, uh, Smenkare is associated with him in a co-regency. Um, now, when I say this, you have to understand that Egyptology is one of those things that attracts a lot of controversy. And a number of people believe that uh, Smenkare didn't really exist as a person and his throne name is just a ne it's the same uh, alternative name that Nefertiti used. So then they're the same person. Other people believe it's two separate people. I'm in that camp. I believe that Smenkare was a real living male and that he married one of the six daughters of Arknaten and Nefertiti. Uh, Tutan Arten also married one of these six daughters. He married the third one, Ankespa Arten, and they had uh, two children. There were two stillborn fetuses found in his tomb. Um, Arknaten is also supposed to have married one of his own daughters as well. So um, th there's quite a lot of complication going on in, in relationships there. So just to reiterate, we have Arknaten married to Nefertiti, who has six daughters. One of them, Ankus Par Arten, is married to Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun is the son of Kaya and Arknaten. So he's marrying his half-sister here. Now, something happened. Something terrible happened. And the entire royal family were decimated. All the heirs disappeared. And all that they were left with was Tutankhamun. And they changed his name, and they changed Ankis Arman's name, and brought them back to Thebes. Now, what happened? There is some thought that maybe plague came to the capital city, that when he was celebrating one of his big um, jubilees, and a lot of foreign visitors came, they brought plague. But all of these people seem to disappear off the horizon. Arknaten, Kaya, Nefertiti, Smenkare, all gone. The, the two eldest princesses gone. The three youngest princesses gone. So we're left with just Tutankhamun and Ankhesaman being manipulated because he was only a young boy of nine. Now who was he being manipulated by? I. His uh, great uncle, his grandfather, his um, father in grandfather in law. The, the relationships are quite complicated, but obviously I and the other person was Horum Heb were manipulating Tutankhamun. Um, so we have all these relationships going on. Now, one of our last lines is I to Ankis Arman. What happened there? Well, when Tutankhamun died, 
Ankathaman wrote to the king of the Hittites. Now, this is a little bit equivalent to Princess Elizabeth writing to Hitler. This is the, the daughter of a royal family writing to their traditional enemies. And she said to the king of the Hittites, My husband is dead and I have no son. They say you have many sons. Give me one of your sons and I will make him king over all of Egypt. Well, the king of the Hittites was a tad surprised about this. And he sent an envoy and she sent another letter saying, why do you doubt me? Do you think I would humiliate myself like me, like this, if it wasn't true? So the king of the Hittites was like, well, he had plenty of sons to spare, so he sent one along. And he didn't make it. He was accidentally murdered by the Egyptian army. Now, who was running the Egyptian army at this time? Warmhead. So there seems like there's a lot of going on. The only other thing we know about Anker Salman is a double cartouche ring that is in the Berlin Museum, which has her name and I's name. So was this poor young girl married to I in order to legitimise his claim to the throne? We don't know, but she disappears off the scene around this time as well. So we don't know what happened to her and of course everybody would love to find a lot of these ladies and identify them. There are various things saying that they have found them but to be honest with you the only um, mummies that I would say have been 100 questions asked identified are you ANCUA and Tink Harmon because of these are the only people that were found in their tombs. Everybody else was re-wrapped, re-labelled, found this, there, and other bits and pieces. I'm not sure you can really, for 100% sure, say that the others have been identified. Um, but uh, I, I could be wrong. So, we have I come to the throne under rather peculiar circumstances. And he's now fairer. And he now wants to have a nice tomb of his own. Now, we think possibly what happened here is that this tomb was going to be Tutankhamun's tomb, and I bunged him in that little tiny tomb, um, which served Tutankhamun very, very well, thank you, nicely, because he was left undisturbed. And this was the one that originally was designed for Tutankhamun. It's quite a deep tomb. Um, and it's undecorated apart from the burial chamber. The burial chamber has four walls decorated. The, the small room off it is undecorated as well. It was discovered by a good old friend, Giovanni Belzoni. He was an Italian circus strongman who came to Egypt and had a uh, um, fantastic eye for looking at, at the side of a hillside and saying, he's there, and he'd find a tomb. Um, he really was quite a clever guy about identifying tombs. Inside the tomb, um, it is decorated in this mustard yellow colour, um, and we have several scenes. This is the wall that has two boats on it, and in the boat there we have the participants in the Artem creation story. The first guy in the boat is Ra Harakti. Then we have Artem. Now, Artem created the next two people by masturbating, and he produced Shu, the god of the air, and Tefnut, the goddess of moisture. They then produce the next two people in the boat, which are Geb, the god of earth, and Nut, the goddess of the sky. They then produce the next two people in the boat and two others. The next two are Osiris and Isis, and they also produce Seth and Nephti. And Cyrus and Isis produced Horus, and he is the last person in the boat. So this is the Artem creation story. 
the Egyptians do have several creation stories, but this is the one that they um, had about Artem. There's another one about Qatar and so forth. They didn't seem to worry. It, you know, you might have a problem with them having several creation stories, but they didn't have one. Now, slightly to the right above that doorway there, it's, it's a little bit distorted in this picture, you can see the four sons of Horus. Um, and they guard the uh, organs of the body. And that's why we think that that room would have been intended to hold the canopus. Now, this is the other side of that wall with the other boat on it. Now, do you notice on that boat, on the prow of it, it's got uh, an eye drawn. And if you've ever been to Cyprus or Turkey or Italy, you will probably have seen fishing boats with these protective eyes drawn on them. <laughs> well, when the Romans came to Egypt, uh, it was a sort of question of did the Romans conquer Egypt or did Egypt conquer the Romans? Because they enjoyed it so much here. They, 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 they loved the history, they loved the gods. The Romans were um, the most unxenophobic nation you can believe and they incorporated a lot of things. They loved the eye of Horus. They, they thought this was a great thing. So that is why you will see the eye of Horus all over the Roman world as protection on boats. Now the, the two occupants of the boats are two um, spirit birds and in front of the boat we have Nephtis the sister of Isis and Osiris. Um, to the right of the picture we have the sarcophagus. Now this was found smashed into many pieces and it was carefully reassembled um, and put on display in the Cairo Museum for many years and then when they reopened this tomb to the general public they put the sarcophagus back in the tomb. It has four protective goddesses at each corner and if you've seen Tutankhamun's treasures in the Cairo Museum you would have seen those four gorgeous little Art Nouveau style ladies holding their arms out protecting the king. Well these uh, ones carved on the red granite here are exactly the same four girls. Isis, Nephtis, Selkit and Neith. And we have a wing disc in the middle there. Now this picture is quite interesting. We've got some damage here, um, but the middle two figures are not damaged. Now the figures that are damaged are of the king of Ai, and just above his head, above the white crown there, you can see that the hieroglyphics are damaged as well. And this is where the double cartouche of Ai was um, uh, carved. The uh, next figure is the goddess and then we have the king's car. Now he also has some hieroglyphics above him and that's the king's golden horse name. So they've damaged the two figures of the king, they've damaged the cartouches, but they haven't damaged the king's car, his spirit, and his golden horse name. Why is this? Well, the damage, we think, was done by uh, the Ramsad kings, and it was because I was still considered associated with this Amarna period, which had a very, very bad name. Um, they called it a period of chaos. Um, and they wanted to get rid of all mention of I and make sure he died the second death. Fair enough, but why did they leave his golden Horus name alone and hit the car? Well, the royal car is the royal car is the royal car, and that stays throughout history. So if they started damaging the royal car, they'd be damaging their own royal car. So that's why the king's royal car and his golden Horus name has been left here. So in the Tomb of I, um, some of the pictures I haven't got in that tomb, those photos were taken a long time ago when you were allowed to take photos, is the hunting in the marshes scene. 
Now, this is completely unique in a royal tomb. The king on a boat with a boomerang in his hand and there's some ducks around and they're in the marshes and his wife is shown hanging on to him and helping him and he's knocking down birds out of the sky. Now, this isn't a royal scene. This is what nobles had in their tomb. This is what they envisaged their afterlife to be. This isn't what royals do. Royals went in the sun god bow and travelled through the heavens and, you know, they associated themselves with Osiris. But I, don't forget, had come to the throne very, very late in life and he had not had a royal upbringing. So I imagine what happens is when he was looking through the plans for his tomb and they were showing him all the different pictures that he could have, he said, there's no hunting in the marshes scene. I want the hunting in the marshes scene. Now, you're not going to turn around to Pharaoh and say, you know, royals don't have hunting in the marshes scenes. You're going to say, yes, Pharaoh, of course, Pharaoh, and paint it on the walls, which is why I suspect he had a hunting in the marshes scene. Now, I mentioned about the four sons of Horus. They are shown in this tomb, two with the white crown, two with the red crown. Um, but variously, they are depicted with um, heads. You see them on the top of canopic jars, and they have responsibilities. They have different organs of the body to guard. So, inseti, human-headed liver, cubex senef, falcon-headed intestines. Harpy, baboon-headed lungs, and um, it, it's either a jackal or it's a dog, we're not quite sure, um, and he looks after the stomach. Where's the heart? Well, the Egyptians believed that the heart was the centre of intellect. They didn't believe that the brain was. Um, they thought the brain was uh, useless rubbish and it was discarded. Um, they... Uh, sort of stuck a crochet hook up the nose, mashed it around inside and pulled out all the brain as sort of yucky stuff and threw it away. But the heart was mummified separately and put back in the body because the heart would be weighed against Mart, the feather of truth, and if you balance, if your good deeds and your bad deeds were about equal, then you would go through and go and live in paradise. One of the other walls we've got is a load of baboons, um, which gives the tomb its nickname, the Tomb of the Monkeys. Um, also, um, the valley itself is called the Valley of the Monkeys. And our little undecorated chamber is probably for the canopy. Now, if we go back to the main valley, um, if you are looking down on the right-hand side, you'll see that to the furthest right that there are remote tombs um, going down those wadis or dry riverbeds. Now, these are the ones that I would recommend you try and visit if you want to get away from the crowds, and also at the bottom of the picture. So in these remote wadis, we have these people. Now, it's quite interesting, Tutmosis IV, because at this period, the early 18th dynasty, they are still relying on secrecy and um, security to, to keep the, the tomb safe. So this is a tucked away, down a little wadi, tucked in the cliffs kind of tomb. Whereas later, at the end of the 20th dynasty, when they're no longer building mortuary temples, the, te the tombs were used for some of the rites. So we have grand, monumental uh, entrances that the uh, offerings and so forth would have taken place at. But Tasmosis IV is still of the era um, of no one seeing, no one hearing. Um, KV-19, Monty Kerr Soft, is um, actually a prince. Now, the Valley of the Kings shouldn't really be called the Valley of the Kings. It should be called the Valley of very important people of the 18th, 19th and 20th dynasty. And not just people, 
animals as well because we have queens in there we have princes in there we have animals in there and we have commoners in there remember ua and Huey, they were buried in the valley of the kings so um uh kv19 there is a prince now those two are fairly close together kv43 and kv19 kv by the way is king's valley um, Sitar and Seti II and Twa'al Sit, uh, Queen, are um, down the bottom wadi that I pointed out, and that little group of three is often very, very unvisited. Whereas in the main valley, where the guides keep people to, you will find huge crowds and, and sometimes queues, and the tombs can be really hot um, and very, very sweaty. But in these remoter wadis, you'll get a nice, clear view of things. So it's, it's much more pleasant to visit. Now, how do you select your three tombs? Um, if you're staying with me, I would love to help you talk about your interests and then pick tombs that I think you will find interesting. But if you're just trying to plan ahead for yourself, one of my guidelines would be to pick one from each dynasty. So our 18th dynasty tombs, these are the tucked away ones, the hidden, the secret ones. These are quite interesting as a style. We've got 19th dynasty ones. Now Ramses I is quite a, that has this sort of bluey grey background, which I think is much nicer than that nappy yellow. Um, and this was a case of he was on the throne for only 18 months so they're digging away corridor stairs corridor stairs and suddenly the guy dies so right at the end there's oh god we've got to make a burial chamber and, and it's quite interesting to see this hastily um finished tomb where they we've made this burial chamber just at the bottom of the the, the flight of stairs uh as i say for the 20th dynasty ones You've got these huge monumental entrances because they were used for ritual purposes. Um, hey, maybe you've got mobility problems. I can advise you which tombs to go to where you're not climbing down 80 metres. Um, things you might be interested in, musicians. There's a tomb that has a lot of musical instruments painted on the walls. So, um, you know, I can definitely help you with that. Now, extra tickets. They closed Ramses VI to the general ticket and made it an extra ticket, and I think that's worth it. It is a spectacular tomb. Um, it's got huge uh, pictures of Nut swallowing the sun and giving birth to it and the stars and um, really, really large tomb, loads of decoration, very rich, very gorgeous. Um, currently, that's 50 Egyptian, and I think it's worth it. Tomb Carmen, I don't think it's worth it. It's a poorly decorated tomb. The treasure is all in Cairo, and apart from the glory of the thing, um, I'm not really sure um, that you'll get a lot out of seeing the paintings. But if your whole holiday would be ruined without going into Tomb Carmen's tomb, by all means, go in it. That is currently 100 Egyptian to go in, um, and you buy these uh, tickets separately at the ticket office. Now, I'm just going to mention the Carter House, because that is just at the beginning of the road that goes into the Valley of the Kings. And this is where Howard Carter actually lived while he was excavating in the valley. Now, for many, many, many years after Carter left, it was left to the Egyptian government and they basically used it as a big storage room. And a few years ago, they decided to restore it as near as possible back to how it was when Carter lived there and open it as a, an attraction. Now, I was lucky enough to get quite involved with this and um, helping out. And it was very interesting. And I... Uh, corresponded with people trying to get information um, and we, we got a, a lot that there was a postcard that identified which room was the dining room which room was the the bedroom there was 
some objects found in the house and this is Harry Burton's camera. Now if you go on to the Griffiths Institute of Oxford, um, the university website there, you will find um, loads and loads and loads of Howe Carter's notes, the photos that were taken at the time, the black and white photos, and they were taken on this camera. Amazing, isn't it? Just to see it there, I, I was stunned. Um, there was also a rather, rather funny thing here, it's a foundation brick, and um, it, it, it was made by Lord Carnarvon and Phil Carter, and all the bottom of the house has these bricks, and they, they say, that, you know, made for Howard Carter, Thieves, 19, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And th th this place that they were made was one of Carnarvon's other um, uh, estates, and he shipped them out to Egypt um, to build Castle Carter. Now, I was told by the Carnarvons that it was a little bit of a joke between Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon, that Lord Carnarvon lived in Highclere Castle, obviously, and that Carter had Castle Carter, uh, this little mud brick house. Um, and that was their, their private little joke. And Carnarvon had paid for it to be built and everything uh, to help Carter out. Now, um, Lady Carnarvon, the current Lady Carnarvon, who is the uh, wife of the great-grandson of our Lord Carnarvon, um, was very kind and produced a lot of storyboards explaining the relationship between Carnarvon and Carter and what they worked on together and everything like that. And um, that she donated them to the museum. And they, they really do explain the story very, very well. And the house itself looks really nice. They've tried to make it as authentic as possible. Um, now, when they opened uh, the Carter house, Zahi Hultwax announced that this bedroom, uh, this bed that Carter slept in, would be available for you to sleep in if you wanted on the night of the discovery, the anniversary of the discovery of the house, of the tomb, and um, uh, it, for the modest price of 20,000 US dollars. So if you've got that kind of money to spare, you can sleep in that bed. To be honest with you, I laid down on it, it's not that comfy, but never mind, it's something you could do. Um, it's a bad photo, but I had to include it, didn't I? This is me with Lord and Lady Carnarvon um, standing behind Howard Carter's desk in the Car Carter house. Um, they're a lovely, lovely couple. Now, she gave me a, a book on the stuff that they've got at Highclere Castle. And if you ever get a chance to visit that in the UK, I, I do recommend it because uh, it, it's, they've got... She spent a lot of time and trouble researching and finding out stuff, and they found one or two little pieces um, that had been left over from, from the time that Carnarvon and Carter uh, worked together, and, and they're all really well displayed there and everything like that. So I, I do suggest you, you visit there. Now, this was the grand opening of the Carter House back in 2009. You can see Lord Carnarvon there speaking, and there were some descendants of Howard Carter's branch of the family there as well. Um, and this cafe has now been opened, and they are serving um, food and drink there. And it's a really nice place. Uh, you know, you come out of the Valley of the Kings, have a cold drink there, maybe have lunch there. Um, very, very pleasant indeed. So that's my uh, talk on the Valley of the Kings and the Carter House. Uh, hope you've enjoyed it and um, I hope you will join me for the next module, the Valley of the Queens.